Good afternoon, friends. My name is Meng, and my job at Google involves creating the conditions for world peace in my lifetime, which is why I'm always excited to find people whose potential impact can create world peace, but who hasn't yet won the Nobel Peace Prize. And one such person is our honored guest today, Father Lawrence Freeman. Father Lawrence is a Benedictine monk who is the director of the World Community for Christian Meditators in London. Father Lawrence believes that meditation restores the contemplative life, which is a vital dimension of Christian spirituality, and that it can also become a natural bridge unifying all religions. And I find myself sharing Father Lawrence's beliefs, and I'm excited and inspired by him and by them. And with that, please welcome our guest, Father Lawrence Freeman. So thank you, Meng. Good afternoon. I'm uh, <laughs> reminded, actually, speaking here in the middle of a busy thoroughfare of uh, doing book launches in, in Barnes and Nobles, uh, which is a, a real test of one's powers of attention and patience. But uh, as what I'm as I'm going to be speaking about meditation as a way of attention which also, I think, gives us the virtue of patience eventually, uh, it may be a good, a good setting for us to, to do this. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at, uh, at Google and um, to see uh, a, a concept of work um, in an organization that uh, seems to be focused uh, upon the well-being, not only of its own employees, but uh, concerned for the common good and the well-being uh, of the world, and using uh, technology and uh, science to um, uh, to implement that that vision. It's uh, very inspiring and uh, wonderful to see. And I think it's not surprising that uh, uh, my friend Meng uh, should be have invited me here uh, to show me around. And uh, this is how I have to earn my delicious lunch. Uh, by giving this talk, but um, it doesn't seem to me surprising that meditation uh, should be a, a familiar element of the uh, of your vision here, or at least something that you're familiar with. And uh, whether you practice it uh, or not, uh, you, you know about it. And living in this part of the world, uh, you're likely to know about meditation anyway. But uh, I think it's significant that um, this... Uh, technological company working at a level of global consciousness and raising global um, consciousness to new levels uh, should also be familiar with and recognize the value of what is traditionally, of course, uh, associated with the spiritual traditions. So um, I'd like to speak with you about that, and maybe what I'm going to say is it will have some resonance with you. you you may uh, know a lot of what I'm going to say, but um, maybe it will be coming from a slightly different uh, part of the human uh, garden. I was talking with, uh, I forget your names, Alicia and Kevin just now about their work on Google Maps, and uh, it reminded me of two icons uh, that I think initiated the, a new era in, uh, in our modern age. One is the picture of Earthrise over the lunar horizon. I forget what date that was, sometime in the 60s. And it was the first time that human beings were able to see the world, see our world objectively from the outside. That's a turning point in human consciousness. It's an image, of course, but uh, it's an image that has begun a, a, a long, wonderful, amazing process of of evolution and speeded up the process of evolution. And I think when we look at that picture uh, of Earthrise, uh, we can't help but feel a certain tenderness towards this crazy world we live in, a certain tenderness uh, and a certain um, 
aesthetic uh, awakening. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see this little blue and white spinning globe in the middle of dark space and uh, to know that it has life and that it's home. And that when we look at the different continents uh, from that distance, we, we, we are aware of the huge uh, range of human culture, religion, personality. And uh, painfully, we're aware that these differences often lead to conflict and violence. Um, and then you look at it and you say, well, why? Why do we fight over our differences? Why, why, why can't we see that we are interdependent, that what's happening in the Amazonian rainforest is going to affect the whole of the globe and so on? Why, why do we act as if we were isolated in individual autonomous beings and instead of seeing ourselves as members of the same incredible spinning human family. So that uh, image uh, came to my mind as I was talking. And then the other image uh, is for about 20 or so years later. Uh, and if you saw it, it was when uh, the Pope invited uh, religious leaders from all over the world to come to a meeting, a spiritual meeting for world peace at uh, Assisi, St. Francis's hometown in Italy. And uh, there's this amazing picture of all the world religious leaders all dressed up in their different finery and their different hats and sticks and, and robes, and, uh, and yet uh, praying together, bringing together this, the richness of the diversity of human religious experience uh, into a common uh, concern for, for peace. So that is the world we're living in, and I, I think Google is uh, certainly uh, a big player in the evolution of that understanding of, uh, of human uh, unity. Uh, there is no peace without unity, so Meng's work for, human pe uh, for world peace is going to depend upon uh, developing uh, unity. And unity comes about not by imposing one point of view, or one system upon another, uh, that's violence, that's conflict, and it never works. We're, we're, we've condemned ourselves to a cycle of violence for as, as long as human history has existed, and uh, we somehow rather never learn the lesson that it doesn't work. But uh, unity depends upon a harmony uh, existing between uh, the widest possible range of expression and belief and uh, an order, a peaceful order of resonance, of harmony uh, between people of different um, b beliefs and cultures and identities. And I believe that meditation is indispensable to, to the achievement of that unity. What happens at the at the personal level also happens or is a microcosm of what happens at the global or the um, <clears throat> the uh, the total level when we meditate we are we are finding peace within ourselves we are allowing the the very different dimensions of our being our human being our physical our emotional, mental, intellectual, aesthetic, and our spiritual dimensions, the body, mind, and spirit. We're allowing all these very different dimensions, which are different, but, uh, but which we cannot separate from each other. And we're allowing them to settle into a dynamic relationship, into an order, into a harmonious um, equilibrium. So that's peace. That's why we people meditate. We meditate in order to find peace within ourselves. But as we find peace within ourselves, we become more consciously active agents in the human family uh, of which we are members. And therefore, we are able to recognize our responsibilities to that family. We become less self-centered, less egocentric. We begin to see that the peace that I'm feeling sets me free to be able to be of service to others. And that's the release of this capacity for compassion, of empathy, 
and of recognizing I have certain gifts that might be useful to other people. And even in using those gifts, I'm not only developing my own potential, but I am uh, being of practical service to others. So I think we need, I think we are able more and more consciously to see meditation as an essential ingredient of this unfolding uh, adventure of uh, human consciousness, which is speeding up uh, in front of our eyes at this moment in, uh, in our history. It's a critical moment. We live in a time of crisis. I was taking part recently in a conference on the environment uh, with among scientists who are proposing different models and different uh, ways of dealing with the crisis. And uh, they pretty much agree on the science, not upon the predictability of the models, but upon the science. Uh, but of course, the major problem is is getting the uh, the will or the common mind among uh, all the interested parties on our, on our planet, uh, all of them pursuing their own uh, nationalistic uh, objectives and economic objectives without much uh, reference to each other or to the available resources on the planet. So um, the spiritual element, for example, in the environmental issue seems to me to be about creating this common mind, this sense, this vision of unity. And it's not, you know, just a theoretical idea. It has to be felt as an experience. It has to be something that you identify with, that you know you are part of this whole, not just by looking at it and coming to a nice platitude, a nice uh, uh, idea. It has to be something felt. In other words, it has to move from being an idea which has a short shelf life in our consciousness. Ideas pass through our minds and uh, very quickly they're nudged along or nudged out by the next idea. Ideas also tend to create uh, a lot of conversation. You present one idea and somebody's going to put question it, analyze it, or confront it. So ideas, uh, of course, can get things started. Good ideas, on the other hand, are, you know, are pretty cheap. What you need after the idea is insight. And it's insight that represents a transformative experience in consciousness. When you've come to an insight, you, you know something. You know it even though you may not be able to prove it yet. And many of the great scientific breakthroughs of the modern period have come about in that way. The, science, the research scientist, while taking a shower or having a snooze, uh, comes to an insight into uh, the, the real pattern of the work they're doing, and they can't quite understand it yet. They can't quite put it together or explain it but um, the insight has led them to a new level of understanding and of knowledge. So I think also at this spiritual level, if you like, uh, insight is, um, is required for change to happen. And meditation is about insight, not about ideas. I think it's important for us to know what the different religious traditions think about meditation. It's important for us to know that meditation is a universal spiritual wisdom. It's as old as the human race. And uh, that meditation itself uh, is seen universally as a way of taking us from the mind, as we generally describe it, to a deeper level of consciousness, universally called the heart. Uh, in most of the religious scriptures. And the heart is not is a symbol uh, within all the spiritual traditions, not so much of emotion as the seat of emotion or of affectivity, but heart, the heart is a symbol of the wholeness of the human being, the, the convergence point where all the different dimensions come together in a simple unity. And we recognize that in our 
ordinary language when we speak about speaking from the heart or giving your heart to something or putting your heart and soul into something. It's about a whole uh, commitment or a whole act of attention uh, which, which we recognize as a high achievement and a high level of experience in, in human affairs. It's also about love. And I'd like to, like to speak a little bit about meditation as a way of love. Uh, that might sound a little soft uh, in such a scientific community, but it seems to me that we need to uh, re-evaluate or re reconnect to the meaning of that word and to see, that, to see love as the fruit of meditation. Um, in, the, uh, in the Bible, for example, the word knowledge is often uh, in Hebrew uh, can is often used in the same sense and sometimes in place of the word love to know is to love to know something deeply comprehensively personally intimately from the inside that is love and I think uh, a human Relationships are human f expressions of love. There are many expressions of love, many forms of love, all of which must be reverenced and respected. Uh, suggests that that is a, a, a way of knowing that enhances our human being because it satisfies such a deep longing within the human being. To know at that level, with that degree of intimacy, with that degree of insight, but also to be known, because to love and to be loved are really two sides of the same coin. So we're dealing with a kind of knowledge that is uh, different. It's a different form of knowledge from the kind of knowledge that we work with. I'm sure you work with when you're dealing with your engineering problems and, and projects. Uh, these are not incompatible forms of knowledge but we don't treat our loved ones in the same way. We don't know them in the same way as we treat our problems or our technical issues. Uh, they're different forms of knowledge, different forms of interaction. So it's this kind of knowledge that uh, I'd like to ask you to, to think of as connected to the work of meditation itself. It's why meditation in my own uh, Christian tradition, uh, which has been recovering its, its own uh, wisdom, its own form of meditation uh, in recent years, part of the work of our community is to, is to reawaken this contemplative dimension of Christianity. Uh, and an important way of doing that is through uh, dialogue with other religions and also with the uh, secular world. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, we, we've always spoken about meditation uh, throughout the Christian tradition as the prayer of the heart. And we need to understand just how precise and how transformative that, uh, that expression really is. That it's not a sentimental, uh, it's not a soft um, kind of uh, experience. It is a transformative, transformative one. Um, but we need to be constantly reminded, I think, of the universality of this way of meditation. I was uh, recently uh, having dinner with some friends who had invited me to dinner because they wanted to start a meditation group. And they invited some of their friends to uh, come along. And before meditation, they asked me to give a little introduction to meditation to their friends. So I did, and then we meditated. And I might invite you to share a little bit of this experience uh, before I finish. I think it's not good to talk about meditation without practicing it, at least for a short time. So after the meditation, I said to the group, uh, 
Okay, anybody have any questions or any comments uh, you'd like to share? And there's one man there who is the uh, CFO of a, of a very large and well-known multinational corporation. And uh, he said to me, uh, how long was that meditation? So I said, uh, about 20 minutes. So he said, well, amazing, he said. It could have been 20 seconds or 20 hours. He said, I just kind of lost all sense of time. And he said, but actually, something else happened. He said, I um, went, I did what you said. I started to meditate in the way you told me. And he said, almost immediately, I went to some other place, to some experience. Or he said, I have no words for it at all. I cannot explain it. I can't even describe it. He said, and the kind of words I would use are words I'm familiar with, you know, from church. Love, joy, peace. But he said these words uh, seem, I, I know what these words mean now because of this experience. But he said, even so, they don't really express what I, was, what I experienced. So he said, I, I don't know, I'm just baffled and amazed and delighted, uh, he said, but I, I don't know what to say. And then he added something else. He said, this is all the more surprising because I have had a really terrible day. He said, I'm very ashamed of something in my life, in my character. He said, I, I cannot control my anger. And you can ask my family or the people I work with and I frequently fly off the handle and I go into a rage and something disappoints me. And he said, that happened to me at the beginning of this day and I've been like it the whole day. And at the end of the day, he said, I feel so ashamed of myself, so soiled, that uh, I really just wanted to go home. But I came here because of my friend. So he said, and then what happens? I find this waiting for me. So uh, we went and had dinner. And uh, I was very interested by his, uh, his remarks and particularly interested in uh, what happened next with him. I mean, it, it certainly doesn't happen very often when people meditate for the first time that they go to this place. But it does happen. And certainly in the early stages of meditation, when you get sort of beginner's luck, uh, you can, it's like when I was, when bowling uh, some time ago, I hadn't been bowling for 20 years, and I couldn't even remember, you had to put your finger in the, in the bowl. Uh, and anyway, when I threw it, very inelegantly, I suppose, I got a strike. And then I did another one. I got another strike. I thought, this, is, this can't go on. I did a third one, and I got another strike. After that, every ball went into the gully. <laughs> Lost it. So you get beginner's luck when you're, when you're unselfconscious about it, and you have no expectations, and you, you're, you're like a child. You just do it simply. So this happens with meditation, too. And this man had, had had this experience. And uh, nothing shows more clearly that the deepest fruit of meditation, which he had tasted briefly, is not connected with your merits, with whether you've earned it or not. And I think that from a spiritual point of view, that is a very important aspect to keep in mind. Uh, most of the religious spiritual traditions call that grace. There's something given about it. Like falling in love. It just happens. It's a gift. You don't earn it, it happens. So it was uh, wonderful, interesting to see that happen in his case. But I was interested to know uh, what happened to him later. Did he continue meditating? Because it's certain that he's not going to have that same experience every time he sits down to meditate. So what happens when he tries again and he's just facing this 
barrage of distractions and his own wandering mind and his all his monkey monkey mind and his Mickey Mouse mind and what happens then? Quite likely, like many people, they give up. He would give up. But actually, when I asked uh, our friend, common friend, a few months later about him, I said, did you start the group? He said, yes. And I said, what about so-and-so? He said, yeah, he's coming every week when he's in town and he's meditating every day as much as he can. Morning and evening is what we recommend. Now, I was very pleased to hear that. And I think it's a, it's a story worth sharing because all of us need that kind of reassurance, that reaffirmation, that meditation touches, opens us to the, to the deepest center, the heart of our humanity, where an incredible treasure awaits us. And it's a treasure that we don't have to earn, we don't have to buy, and we don't have to even to be good to, 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 uh, uh, to, to, to find. But we have to, we have to, we have to do some work uh, in order to, uh, to receive it and to, to, to uh, stay in tune with it. So, um, the other reason for mentioning the story is another aspect of meditation I'd like to put before you, and that is the difference between technique and discipline. Now, you can certainly meditate as a technique, and maybe for many people in a secular world where science is, you know, uh, the final authority on the, on the value of things, uh, this, is, this is how we begin. And I think maybe in a sense we all begin at this technique level. In other words, you're told, do these things, do these practices, and you will find certain benefits. And the benefits will be peace of mind, or the benefits will be controlling your anger. Uh, lowering your blood pressure, improving your cholesterol, boosting your immune system. As I was saying to the earlier group I was with, it, it doesn't restore your hair, unfortunately, as I can prove, but it has benefits uh, which science and uh, neurology and neuroscience and uh, the psycho psychiatrists, we had a seminar on mental health in London recently, the British government is very interested in making meditation part of its national mental health policy because it's cheaper to give meditation rather than medication. And uh, all the evidence is piling up with all the different research projects, which we are a small part of as well. But I think, uh, so at that technical level, you, you focus upon the, uh, the, the benefits of meditation. But I think as those benefits begin to appear, you begin to see more. As it were, the horizon begins to expand. And we begin to move from thinking just about the immediate benefits from the technique, we begin to see what we might call the spiritual fruits of meditation. And in all religious traditions, I'm thinking of, say, the letter to the Galatians in the New Testament or the Dhammapada in Buddhism, there is a remarkable agreement on what are the fruits of the spirit or the qualities uh, that come about through a transformation of consciousness, through spiritual practice at this level. And the first of them all is love, metta, compassion. Those are different words, but essentially, it's that uh, fundamental human uh, energy of love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fidelity, gentleness, self-control. And as these spiritual fruits begin to appear, I think the, 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 the map of our own consciousness becomes greater. 
we begin to see ourselves uh, less and less from an egotistical, egocentric point of view, and that that range of I don't know what you call it with maps, but the 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 vista of the map begins to expand, and you see yourself without without losing yourself entirely, but your whole sense of self is transformed as you see yourself as part, an active, integrative part of something greater. And as that vision expands, that becomes insight. It's an insight into yourself. Self-knowledge is the most transformative thing we can, we can experience. All religious traditions speak about self-knowledge as the basis of development. In the Christian tradition, we say self-knowledge is the basis of our knowledge of God. You cannot know God without knowing yourself. And self-knowledge, I think, in all traditions, uh, has has um, uh, has that same uh, value in the transformative process. So, um, of course, there are levels of self-knowledge. Coming into the states, each time I come, you know, I have to fill out the same forms and say where I was born, my date of birth, and profession and address and and so on and if you have more forms to fill out you fill out your qualifications or lack of them or and uh, so there and there's that's a form of self-knowledge that connects us to society into a culture and to our job career pr progress and so on but there's another level of self-knowledge where we are conscious as we get older of the patterns of our minds and emotions, as we see ourselves uh, repeating certain mistakes, uh, as we see ourselves reacting in the same way, sometimes a negative way, uh, in certain situations, and we know that certain situations are going to trigger a certain response that we would like to control better. So we become self-aware at that important psychological level. And uh, we cannot change at that level without coming to consciousness about those, those blocks and those re repeated patterns. It's an essential part of the 12-step program, I think, that we come to a self-awareness uh, before change can take place. But there's another level of self-knowledge, which the great spiritual traditions focus on, and which my friend, the CFO, had, had unexpectedly... Uh, dropped into uh, immediately and unpredictably, and that is the uh, the knowledge of the self, knowing, pure knowing. And that it's not knowing anything about yourself; it's just knowing yourself. It's pure consciousness. It's not attached to any image of yourself or any idea or even any belief system. It is the very core of human existence, of human consciousness. And it's that self-knowing, better maybe calling it self-knowing rather than self-knowledge, that I think we call love. When we experience that self-knowing, we experience an expansion and a delight and a fulfillment of our being, which we only experience uh, in love and through love. And it's knowing not only that we are loved, or that there is love, uh, you know, um, flowing through us, but also knowing that we are capable of expanding our capacity for love. And that's what happens as we put this experience into practice. So that's more or less what I, what I mean by saying that meditation leads us to the knowledge that is love. I'd like to just say a few words about the three of the essential elements of meditation and then invite you just for a few minutes to experience it and then we'll take some time to meditate together, uh, to some time for discussion. We our community has a priority in its work at the moment of teaching meditation to children. 
And uh, it's wonderful to teach meditation to children because they respond to it so immediately, so naturally. They like to meditate and they can meditate. And we, um, we always notice, I always notice when meditating with children, that they teach us. Once you teach a child how to meditate, immediately the child will go into it with some variations, but they immediately go into it. And, uh, and then they are really teaching us. And the first thing they teach us is that meditation is simple. You can have a thousand PhD you know, uh, research projects into, into meditation, into the science of it, the neuroscience of it, and so on. All of that's interesting. It's persuasive. We need it. But it should never blind us to the fact that meditation is simple. And what do we mean by simple? We mean that it is total in some way, that it, that it um, is uh, something that we don't need to and, in fact, cannot analyze or dissect. And we shouldn't try to dissect it, because if we try to analyze or dissect it, we are complicating it. The word uh, simple comes from the Latin word simplex. And it was used to, could I just have that piece of paper there, Ming? Thanks. It was used as a, a, a term uh, to describe the way tailors or cloth merchants used to uh, fold cloth. And as they folded the cloth to make it fit into a smaller space, they would uh, make the cloth more complex. And so to simplify, simplex meant that the cloth was simply unfolded. And you can't unfold that any more than it is now. So meditation is simplicity itself. It's just as we are, as our mind is, as our whole being is, absolutely open, not closed in upon itself, analyzing itself, but just open to what is. The simple enjoyment of the truth, as St. Thomas Aquinas called it in the 12th century. The simple enjoyment of the truth. So the first thing you learn is that meditation is simple. The second is that meditation is about stillness. When we meditate, we try to sit physically still because that physical stillness will help to uh, keep you in the present moment and it will also help to bring stillness to the mind. The mind is constantly moving, constantly searching, constantly, uh, constantly moving between the past and the future, and very rarely allows us to enjoy the truth and the delight of the present moment. And yet the present moment is, of course, the only thing we are totally sure of. And God is the eternal now in the mystical traditions, just as God is infinitely simple in the same mystical traditions. So we try to sit still, and we try to bring the mind to stillness. And the way we bring the mind to stillness is through an act of attention, a repetitive act of attention, a faithful, we could say, act of attention that we repeat despite the fact that we're constantly failing. And that's why it's very important for us to give up the idea of success or failure uh, with regard to meditation. The best way we have of approaching it, I, I think, is like a child, to think of it as a kind of a play, and a serious play. Well, we take sport very seriously, but that's only playing. Well, we should take our meditation very seriously, but still remember that it's playing. So we don't have to succeed or fail, we just, we just are faithful to it. Choosing the method of meditation with which you do that is, of course, up to you. But uh, the great spiritual traditions give us uh, a number of approaches, different methods. 
one I'll share with you is one that uh, is central to the Christian tradition, but it also, of course, as many of you will recognize it, it has resonance with uh, other uh, spiritual traditions as well. The advice uh, in this tradition is to take a single word or a short phrase, could be a sacred word in your own tradition if you have one, and you repeat it continually in the mind and heart during the time of the meditation, simply letting go of the stream of thought, memories, plans, anxieties, daydreams, fantasies, as this phantasmagoria of the mind just continues to be produced, you just let go of it. You don't fight it, you don't try and deal with it, you just let go of it. And you let go of it by returning your attention to the, uh, to the word, to the mantra, to the sacred word, to the prayer word, however you want to call it. So that's the, that's the method uh, that we would recommend as a way of coming to stillness. And you can teach that method to a six-year-old child or to somebody on their deathbed in a hospice. It's something that that CFO I mentioned is putting into practice uh, every morning and every evening as he takes 20 minutes to meditate in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. And if he's keeping that up, it's because he's feeling the benefits of it. And the, the other aspect of meditation I think it's worth considering is silence. According to Meister Eckhart, the 12th century Christian mystic, there is nothing so much like God as silence. And silence is not the absence of noise. It is the, it is the perfection of attention. Silence is the fruit of attention and when you are really paying attention, you are being silent. Silence opens up for us this, this common ground uh, that lies beyond the, all the diversity of words and belief systems. That's why meditation is the basis of all interreligious dialogue. So, silence, stillness, simplicity. That's, the, that's what we do when we meditate. That's the, those are the muscles we're exercising. Those are the qualities that we are practicing and that we see uh, playing out and appearing in our daily life and work and relationships. Come back to that simple method that I mentioned. Uh, many of you may have your own method of meditation. You're happy with that and stay with that, obviously. But uh, this, this is the way we, we teach it. And we can take just a few minutes to practice it now before a few minutes of uh, discussion. Try to take a moment to sit uh, still, sit upright. Leo, could you just give me my bell? Um, sitting with the back straight, uh, with your feet on the ground, or cross-legged if you prefer, but the basic rule of posture is simply to sit with your back straight. And that helps you to stay awake. Thanks. To stay awake and to be alert. You should be relaxed and alert at the same time. Take a moment just to be aware of your breath as you breathe in and breathe out. We breathe about 20 or 30,000 times a day, but just take a few moments to be conscious of your breath. And the consciousness of your breathing helps to calm the mind and bring the mind into the same space as the body. So the body becomes a kind of anchor for the mind. The body is part of this experience, part of this journey. Close your eyes lightly. Relax the muscles of your face. Relax your shoulders. And then silently in your mind, in your heart, begin to say your word, your mantra. Choosing the word is important. You need to stay with the same word. 
The word I would recommend is an ancient uh, sacred word, Maranatha. It's in Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. It means, come Lord. We're not thinking about the meaning of it as we say it, though. Saying it as a sound, listening to it with full attention. And returning to the word continuously as the mind wanders. Bringing it back as if to an anchor or walking on a path through a jungle of thought, this path of silence that the mantra leads us on. The word again I would suggest is Maranatha. Maranatha. Maranatha.
Good. So I think we have a little time left. If um, anyone would like to share any comments or raise any questions at all. How do, you, how do you choose the word for this kind of meditation? Well, in uh, many traditions, of course, uh, you're, you're given the word. Uh, in the uh, Indian tradition, it's whispered into your ear as a, you know, as a young child, and it's your mantra for life. And in most traditions, or spiritual traditions, you're advised to take a word. But the, basic, um, the basic principles of it are that it should be um, a word that um, <clears throat> you stay with the same word. It's advisable, I think, to take a word that has a sacred meaning, uh, although you're not thinking about the meaning of it as you say it. It's important not to think about it. Uh, and for that reason, it's helpful if it's not in your own language. So, and then also, it's helpful if the sound of the word is calming, so the open vowel sound of Maranatha is very calming, and you actually that kind of resonates with mantras in other traditions. And also um, that the length of the word should be such that it's easy to say, or easier to say uh, rhythmically. Some people say the mantra with their breath, so you could say the whole word as you breathe in, and breathe out in silence. Or if you have the four syllables, you could say the first two syllables, ma, ra, as you breathe in, na, tha, as you breathe out. I think uh, the important thing is to say it simply, naturally. And most people find their own rhythm. And it, it finds its own rhythm by itself. So I would advise not, not tying it to the breath, but just resting it on the wheel of the breath but giving the full attention to the to the word, and then eventually it, it finds its own rhythm. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I think if you're raising your children in a in a you know in a tradition in a religious tradition, then you want to you know you want to uh, you know give them the, the 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 stories and give them the the facts and give them the familiarity with with the tradition appropriate to their age, and then that becomes more sophisticated as they get older. So I think that's uh, that's the you know that's important, but I also think it's very important to recognise that children have this innate capacity for contemplation. They're born contemplative. We lose it later, no doubt. So you come back to it when you're 35 or something, and you and you uh, say, oh, this is so difficult. I can never do it. You know, I uh, it's so complicated, or I'm just not good at this. Um, so if I think if we can give children this gift. Uh, at the beginning and give them the method of staying in touch with this innate capacity. We're giving them something that will make the religious tradition alive for them. Most kids today will abandon that religious tradition as they get older, uh, under the pressures of whatever. But uh, I think this is the best way I, I know, and our experience so far has shown this in schools, so uh, they go together, yeah, they're complementary. If you go to our website, wccm.org, you'll see um, some information about what we're doing and also some uh, videos of a conference we had um, <clears throat> recently on meditation and education. But if you, if you like, also afterwards I can give you an address and send you some stuff on it.
Mm, okay.